So this is our lesson four, tag questions and intonation. So you doubtless already know how to use tag questions. Um, so we're gonna focus on how we pronounce the tag questions, what kind of tone we use um, to convey the right information. Uh, so first, if I could have you read our vocab list of these eight words. Can you hear me? Sí. Okay. So, um, a shift, couple, data, document, income, link, objective, status. Okay. So this one, the IE is a little harder, a chi, like it's an EE -E sound. Uh, otherwise, it was good. Objective has the accent on the E, so objective. Uh, other than that, it was really good. Two of these words have different pronunciations for the um, in England and in Australia. Instead of data, they would say data with a uh, shorter A. And then instead of status, they would say status. Um, so just so you're aware of those different pronunciations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. If I could have you read uh, this statement about intonation in tag questions. So could you read this for us? Well, mm -hmm. When the speaker is not sure about the estimate and wants confirmation from the listener, the intonation of the tag question rise. Right. So when you are not sure about the statement you're making and you're using a tag question, that tag question is going to rise. Uh, could you read this one? Is the same? It's different. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe my my screen goes low. Oh, okay. A tag question is a short question at the end of the statement. Uh, at the end of statement. Sorry. Good. It can ask the listener to confirm what the speaker is saying or it can ask for the listener listener's agreement good so depending on your intonation you're going to anticipate um, either a positive or a negative response um, from your listener but you're asking them to confirm this information one way or another um, so we'll we'll do this towards the end because I'm sure you've studied this grammar before. A tag question is formed using the modal or auxiliary verb in a sentence. So we're gonna grab the modal or the auxiliary in the tag question. It agrees in number and tense with the main verb. So the same uh, plurality or singularity and in the same tense, uh, but it has the opposite positivity. So if it's negative in a sentence, it's positive in the question. If it's positive in the sentence, it's negative in the question. And uh, okay. another one, could you read this? A tag question is formed using a, uh, when, the speak, when the speaker is making a small talk and wants the listener to agree, the intonation falls, not the intonation of the tag question falls. Right. So this this one, when you when it falls, this means you're making a statement and you expect them to agree with you. You're adding the tag question. When you expect agreement, your voice is going to fall. Uh, you're not expecting them to contradict you. So let's practice what that looks like here. Uh, in this sentence, the objective of the research was interesting, wasn't it? So my voice isn't going up because I expect this to be a true statement. So I'm expecting th them to say, yes, it was. Um, so could you practice uh, saying this sentence? The objective of the research was interesting, wasn't it? Good. So we wanted to fall both of the last uh, word in the statement and in the question. So we're going to fall twice. Research was interesting, wasn't it? So like doing waves here. 
So try one more time. Okay. The objective of Richard was interesting, wasn't it? Perfect, wasn't it? So we want to, even though it's got a question mark, we want to say this sentence as if it's not a question, like it's a statement. Let's try this one. They are going to help each other get healthier, aren't they? They are going to help each other get healthier, aren't they? Good. So let's try it the other way, and you can maybe see how it's different with a rising intonation. If I say they're going to help each other get healthier, aren't they? This means I doubt they are, but I'm hopeful that they will. Um, so I'm asking the other person, like, please say that they will, um, even though I don't think it's reality. Okay, could you read this statement for us? They are going to he help each other. Oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I was lowly. No. <laughs> When the speaker is not sure about the estimate and want confirmation from the listener, the intonation of the tag question rise. Okay, so now we're going to practice the rising. Uh, but real quick, could you say this word for me? Statement. Statement, good. Yeah, I know in Spanish there's an E before it. I think it, it keeps tripping you up because usually the comes before a statement. So the E is right there. Um, but we want to make sure we start with an S on that word. Okay. So we're going to try, oops. Oh, this is supposed to be a rising arrow. Uh, we'll say it with a rising intonation. Sharing my good news helps others, doesn't it? So sharing my good news helps others, doesn't it? Right. So to be honest, if if I say this with the wrong intonation, it can actually be kind of rude. So say, for example, that I have some good news and someone else has uh, maybe a really hard day or really sad news. So I want to know if sharing my good news is going to help them feel better. If I use rising intonation, then it's actually a question. I'm actually trying to find out if it will be helpful or if it won't be helpful for me to say this. So the person listening to me is going to understand that I'm being compassionate. But if I use following intonation here, that means that I expect that my good news is going to be good enough for them to feel better. So I'm not really asking, should I say it? It's, uh, it's trying to force the other people to hear my good news. So if I say it with following intonation, sharing my good news helps others, doesn't it? Um, this means that I'm trying to elicit from that person a positive response. Honestly, even if they don't agree with me, I'm almost bullying them into saying what I want them to say. Um, so we want to be careful uh, to use rising intonation when we're making a positive statement that might be controversial. Let's try it again here. My behavior won't affect my friend's behavior, will it? My behavior won't affect my friend's behavior, will it? Right. So this would be a child who's perhaps acting inappropriately, and he's worried that his friends will, uh, will copy his behavior. But if he says it with falling intonation, my behavior won't affect my friend's behavior, will it? Um, he, is, he would be rude to his parents if he said it this way. Um, He's, he's asking a question, but it's not really a question. Okay. Uh, we're going to have you create the tag question on the end of these sentences. And we're going to practice it in both ways. And you'll tell me whether or not it's acceptable to use falling intonation. Uh, remember, that's the one that can be rude if the statement might be controversial. So we're going to read it both ways, and then you tell me uh, whether or not you think it might be important to use a falling intonation. So let's try with number one. Your friend's bad mood 
can affect you. Um, so how do we make the tag question? Do you remember? We run a grab can, yeah. can cannot eat. Good, good. Uh, in the tag question, when it's possible, we're going to reduce the um, the verb together with the negative particle. Um, so instead of can, uh, what? yeah. So your friend's bad mood. So in this one, uh, do you think we need to always use the rising intonation, or is it okay to use falling intonation? What about this okay. intonation? So <clears throat> if the person who is speaking is expecting that the other agree, I will use falling intonation. Okay. And I think that is expecting that you agree, that your friend's bad mood cannot affect you. So I will use... Um, I, I think as a mom, yeah. <laughs> I, telling that to my son, I will say that I expect that he's agree with me. Exactly, exactly. I completely agree with you. The information in the sentence, uh, it's general knowledge. It's commonly accepted uh, that someone's bad mood will make someone else have a bad mood. So it wouldn't be controversial at all to propose this statement. Um, with falling intonation. So let's try number two. The friends are going to work together, aren't they? And that's his asking because I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Good, so uh, rising or falling intonation, or can I use both? But yeah, you can, if, uh, if uh, you assume that is going to work together, that can go both sides, I guess. Right. So if I don't know if they're going to work together and I'm genuinely asking, uh, we want rising intonation. If the intonation falls, uh, this could almost be like a teacher speaking to her students where she's being polite, but she's still telling them what to do. She's asking it in a question form. But the purpose of the question is not to ask them a question, it's to give them a command, but a polite command. So if, if she uses falling intonation, the friends are going to work together, aren't they? Uh, she's not asking them yes or no, she's telling them this is what I expect of you. Yeah. Okay. Let's try number three. The research document their data. Good. Didn't they? Mm -hmm. So if I'm using rising intonation, what might be the context there? They say the researchers documented their data, didn't they? That you are not sure that they they're actually did it. Exactly, right? So it might infer that the person asking this question is doubting their research. Um, she wants to see some data, and it doesn't appear that they have any. Um, how about with falling intonation? The researchers documented their data, didn't they? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, because it's not really something that you can command, especially since it's in the past tense, documented. It's hard to give a proposition or, a, uh, or an expectation in the past tense. All right, let's try four. Social status will affect, affect your health. One eight. Mm -hmm. What do you think here? Rising, falling, or both? I think that will be fall because I think that we know that your social status is something that will affect your health and everybody knows that you have better access to probably um, see, uh, health system and also food and better lives. So I will say that you will use the fall intonation. Social mm -hmm. status will affect your health. Want it. Perfect, yeah. And that's true. What you said. It's, it's going to be because it's common knowledge. We can use a falling intonation. Okay, how about five? 
positive, positive thinking groups of, of friends is linking to happiness. Um, that I, I think that so will will that that will be um, isn't it? And uh, I I will just like I will use also as a fall like it's an estimate that I think we all could agree. Right, right. Yeah, we could all agree with this. I think we could use uh, rising intonation. It's possible, but the falling intonation is definitely going to be more common here uh, because you're making a statement uh, that either is common knowledge or logical, and the logic is clear. Uh, so positive thinking among groups of friends is linked to happiness, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, we can use rising or falling. Uh, the, how about uh, number six here? The couple achieved their goal together, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, the couple is, they will, it will be, didn't eat or how do you put that? Uh, the couple. So this one is kind of challenging. The subject is singular, uh, but the idea is plural. Um, it's a cumulative noun. So we're going to use plural they here. And it's not okay. because of the grammar, but because of the context. OK. So that will be a rice intonation because we really don't know. Exactly. We, we don't know. A couple of kids are called to didn't they? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this one's going to definitely be more common in rising intonation than falling. So all that to say, uh, rising or falling intonation in a tag question, uh, it always asks for confirmation, but falling is going to expect agreement. Rising is going to offer um, either agreement or disagreement. It's a genuine question. Uh, so when you're asking, be cautious about that, but also when you're listening to others, if they ask a question, but they use falling intonation, uh, the context is meant to tell you that they expect you to agree. So if you disagree with them, they expect to explain your answer, or if they don't, uh, if they don't ask for your explanation, uh, imagine that it might be possible that they uh, are offended. Uh, so again, things to be careful about in spoken English here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we got all these correct, and then the last one was more challenging. It needs a plural um, tag question. Very good. All right, so the last thing we'll do for our pronunciation practice, uh, reading through some of Borges' essays. Here. So if you could read this paragraph uh, from Borges, uh, Borges Io. Borges and I. Okay. It Borges, the other one, that things happen to. I walk through Buenos Aires and I pause, mechanically now perhaps, to gaze at the arch of an entryway and it is inner door. News of Borges reach my me by mail, or I see his name on a list of academic or in some biolog biographical dictionary. My pace ran to hourglasses, maps, 17th century, typeface, etymologies, the taste of coffee, and the prose of Robert Louis Stevenson. Borges shares those preferences, but in a vain sort of way that turns them into the accountrement of an actor. Okay, so we're going to practice a couple of these words. Uh, here, this it's, there's no apostrophe. So this is going to be a possessive, it's. 
um, not it is. So we want to always say oh, those yeah. sounds together. So it's uh, it's inner doorway. It's. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then here this word academics, the uh, the emphasis or the rise in this word is going to be on the e academics. Academics. Okay. And then biographical. The rise is in Bi the A. <laughs> biographical. Good. And this I is going to have a long sound, bio, instead of bio. So biographical. Biographical. Good. All right. And then here, our glasses, the accent is going to be in the first noun of this compound noun. So hourglass, and then this one with the hyphen is going to have two accents because these words still maintain a separate, um, separate sounds. So we got seventeenth with the accent on the first e, and then century with the accent on the first e. So seventeenth century. Seventeenth century. Okay. And then this compound word, typefaces, and this means fonts, or the fonts that he uses in his writing. So the uh, Can you repeat? Mm -hmm. Typefaces. What that mean? Uh, it means font, letters, the different fonts that you will use for your writing. So for example, on this page, I've got three different typefaces. I have a cursive typeface uh, for my logo. I have a serif typeface for the writing and then sans serif typeface uh, for my website down here in the corner. So all these are different typefaces. Mm. So typefaces, oh, accent is gonna be in the line. Okay, and then etymologies, accent is in the O, etymologies, and you know etymology, it's the same in, in Spanish, the study of the origin of a word. Yeah. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, probably you know his books, he wrote Treasure Island, and um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So what is the saying that he mm -hmm. enjoys his prose and prose are um, prose and poetry are two different forms. Poetry is poetic grammar structure. Prose is grammar structure, just like we uh, we read fiction books or the same. Yeah. I have we have the same word in Spanish. OK, oh, prosa. yeah, OK. I've uh, been teaching in Korea for two and a half years. So I've what's common with Spanish and English? Because things like this, I have to explain in Korea. Uh, that's good. Yeah. I'm sure you know what most of these words are. Uh, all right. Preferences. No, it's not. A, I don't know what is the uh, the la the this one. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Yeah. So the pronunciation of this word is accoutrements. Accoutrement. Accoutrement. And let me get you a good definition of this one. Okay, so an accoutrement is, um, yeah, like accessories. So, um, like when you go to town, you have accessories, a purse, um, probably some kind of jewelry. These are accessories. Mm. So he's saying all of the things that he likes, but then also the famous yeah. what he likes when he enjoys the same things as people talk about him enjoying. He feels like he's acting, um, like he's supposed to like this because everyone knows he likes these things. Okay, let's mm. keep going. Uh, next paragraph here.
Okay, it will be it will be an exaggeration to say that our relationship is hostile. I leave. I allow myself to leave, like not to lie. Live. I I, I leave. Okay, I was in doubt. I leave. I allow myself to leave so that Borges can spin out his literature and that literature is my justification. I willing, I willingly admit that he has written, written a number of song pages, but those pages will not save me, perhaps because the good in them no longer belong to any individual not even to that other man, but rather to language itself or to tradition. Beyond that, I'm dumb, dumb. doomed. <laughs> Again? Doomed. I'm doomed. Mm -hmm. Utterly and inevitably mm -hmm. to ab oblivion. <laughs> And fleeting moments will be all at me that survives in that other man. Good. So you got most of it. Um, the word hostile. Um, sometimes we say it hostile. Other times, and especially as, um, as a predicate adjective, we say hostile uh, when it stands alone. So when it's modifying a noun, its sound is reduced to hostile, but when it stands alone, often hostile. Okay, this uh, tricky word, live, uh, which has another pronunciation as an adjective being alive. Uh, as we're going through, when it follows a pronoun immediately, uh, it's 99.9% .9 of the time going to be a verb. So we want the soft I to live. And then I allow myself to, so after uh, particle two for an infinitive, it's gonna be a verb. Um, so those are some hints that you can give yourself along the way of how to pronounce this word after a pronoun and after the particle two, um, it's often gonna be live. Good. Uh, and then uh, this U in justification, is a soft U, so not the U, but the A, uh, so justification. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, and you tried two times, but you got willingly, successfully on your second try. Uh, it looks like a hard word to pronounce, but I think once you, uh, once you looked at it twice, you saw what it was. Um, number of sound pages. I think that was all. And then we got down here to doomed. Uh, do you know the meaning of doomed? Like not as smart? Uh, dumb, D-U-N-B, would be not so. Doomed uh, means that you are, uh, for example, awaiting destruction. Your end will be destruction. So when you're doomed, it means um, you can't survive. Okay. You are uh, you're doomed. Uh, yeah. Condemned to death or something. Condemned. Like uh, utterly and inevitably. Utterly means completely. Um, inevitably is another word that means unavoidably. He can't avoid that doom. Uh, and his doom, condemnation, is to oblivion. Oblivion, uh, I think, shares a root word with Spanish. Um, oblivion would be like nothingness, um, to disappear from understanding. Mm -hmm. Oblivio, possibly. Um, so the fleeting moments, the moments that fly away, uh, will be all of me that survives in that other man. And that other man is the famous Borges of the Borges that he is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think this is 
Okay, two more. So here's third of four. Little by little, I have been turning everything over to him. Though I know the perverse way he has of this distorting <laughs> and magnifying everything. Spinoza believed that all things wish to go on being what they are. Stone wishes eternally to be stone and tiger to be tiger. I shall endure in, Bor in Borges, not in myself, if indeed I am nobody at all. Anybody. But I recognize, <laughs> but I recognize myself less in his books than in many others, or in the tedious strumming of a guitar. Okay. So, see, little by little, da, da, da. though I know the perverse way he has of distorting and magnifying everything. Uh, so I want to look at the grammar in this clause for a second, just to see if you can identify its parts. So I know the perverse way. Uh, this is a reduced relative clause. We could put the relative part, uh, pronoun that though I know the perverse way that he has of distorting and magnifying everything. So this is a subordinate clause. He has of distorting and magnifying everything. But here's what I want you to look at. Here's a pronoun, he, a verb, has. But notice that in the object, it starts with of. So it's a prepositional phrase going to make his object. So be careful of this. This particle or this preposition is not functioning as a particle to this verb, but as a very unique way of making a preposition or prepositional phrase into an object. And it goes together with his main clause here. So his perverse way of distorting and magnifying everything, he's added in this he has um, for emphasis, making sure that you know that it's the other Borges and not himself. Um, I don't know if that is helpful to you, um, but it's one thing that stands out to me when I read this um, paragraph. It's a little complicated. I don't think I will be at the level to write that way with you know, <laughs> uh, to be honest, it's complicated. <laughs> it is complicated. It is. Uh, oftentimes when I'm analyzing a text, I'll diagram the sentence to see how his grammar will function. Because Portis, although he wrote in Spanish, was also very good at English. Uh, and sometimes he's even skilled enough at English to use his grammar uh, as part of his writing structure. He's not just conveying words, but he's conveying thoughts through grammar as well. Uh, I guess kind of like and in, symphonies. In literature, at least in Spain, one of the things that you have permission to do is break the rules. So at least in Spain, I will not use a test, literally test to, to show grammar because actually uh, we consider consider like a high literature break the rules, <laughs> if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, like, there are certain cases uh, in English in which literature breaks the rules, uh, but we kind of go by the the uh, the rule of thumb that literature has grammar rules. And if you break the rules, it has to be for a very specific purpose. Uh, that purpose would be drawing attention to that over everything. Yeah. Else. So if you break a rule, yeah. that's the focus of your statement. Um, yeah. That for us really is the difference between prose and poetry. Poetry uh, is a lot looser with its grammatical structure. Literature, just like essays, is going to be very structured. Um, so uh, everything that Borges says here, 
granted, this is a, uh, this is not literature. This is an essay that he wrote. Um, yeah. But he wrote this originally so in uh, Spanish. So his translator is the one who has brought his grammar into English. Um, actually, well, this was written in 82 or 83, I think. So it, he may have written this, or he may have translated it himself. Um, I'd have to check on that. Anyways, um, see, I recognize myself less in his books than in many others. So here we've got this uh, possessive uh, adjective, his okay. books, and then in many others, and then it ends that, uh, that phrase here. This others is a plural with an apostrophe. So it is a plural. But he's left off this uh, word books. So in many others books, this is an elliptical sentence. It means the information that's shared between these two clauses is missing. Um, he only writes it once. So we have to recognize a possessive here and a possessive without an object is going to share the same object. Um, OK, the tedious strumming of a guitar. All right, our last paragraph here in Porta's essay about himself. Years ago, I tried to free myself from him, and I moved on from the mythologies of the Islam and out a skirt mm -hmm. of the city to gains with time and infinity. But those gains belong to Borges now. And I shall, I shall have to think up other things. So my life, it's a point, counterpoint, a kind of fugue mm -hmm. and a falling away. And everything winds up being lost to me. And everything falls into oblivion. <laughs> or into the hands of the other men. I'm not sure which of us it is that writing this page. Right. All right. Actually, your, uh, your pronunciation on this paragraph was great. Um, oh, cool. this, this word is, you pronounced it correctly. Uh, it's probably one of the hardest words on this page, fugue. Fugue is a form of, um, of music. Uh, I believe Mozart wrote quite a few fugues. And a fugue is, is based on this point counterpoint. It's like a call and response um, sound. Um, that's not the best definition of a fugue, but me not being uh, someone who's very musical, uh, that's the best way I know how to explain it. Uh, but eventually, all things, away, everything winds up lost to him. Um, but possibly um, still remaining with the other Borges. All right. So I know it's not the easiest uh, essay to understand. It's pretty, uh, I guess, psychological. But what do you think Borges trying to say about himself in this essay? Just your immediate thoughts about what he might be trying to say. Uh, I think that he is in a time in his life that he already becomes somebody notorious mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes he is not sure if he is being the image of what he become or if he's being Borges the authentic person and not the famous writing. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good and succinct analysis um, of what he's saying here. Um, like you said, this obviously comes at a point in his life where he already had a level of notoriety. So even though I didn't have the date of this writing, you can tell it's towards the end of his career, or at least after major successes in his career. The main question, or the main controversy in this statement is, uh, once again, who exactly is Borges? He's having an existential crisis. Uh, what does it mean to be him? And I think in his mind, he knows the answer. 
but he's posing the questions rather than the author to get the, the reader thinking about themselves, uh, or perhaps thinking more deeply about him and his writing. This is a real person writing these um, essays, writing these stories. And as a real person, he has his own way of interpreting his own stories. But the world sees him as his books, not as his person. So um, no, I think the way that you put it is very succinct. Um, uh, that would uh, likely be a very good paragraph in an essay uh, if you were to write on Borges. I know I, I meant to give the essay to or this uh, essay that he wrote to you earlier, um, but then we didn't end up writing that essay, so we didn't need to. And uh, I have a question. When I express myself, I use in grammar properly. Do you think? Uh, yes, I'd say. I'd probably give you a nine out of 10 for your grammar. Sometimes the oh, wow. is a little, a little off. Uh, the accent will be in the wrong place or the emphasis will sound in the wrong uh, place, but your grammar is very good. Uh, okay. yeah, I wouldn't be too concerned with that. There are things like uh, with plurals, sometimes your S's drop off. Um, I recognize that although that's a grammatical error, I think you're not making it as a grammar error, but a pronunciation error. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so let's see, I think. 